center and property seminar. I know all of you are just trying to get to the last bit and work out if properties have gone up, have gone down, and what you think it's going to look like in the future. So I promise not to waste a lot of your time because we don't want to be tired for lobby at the end. Um, so the speakers today are going to be myself, I'm Clinton. Um, we're going to have Poonam stepping in a little bit later. Poonam, there you go. Um, and then lastly, Lucky Lucky. Um, other celebrities in the office, uh, we have Michelle Maynard. You might have seen her on Channel 9 before. <laughs> She's the Channel 9, uh, what, 4.30? 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock? Prime time. The finance specialist. So if you need to know anything later on, she loves on the spot questions. <laughs> Alright, let's get cracking. Alright, so a little bit about myself. So I am Talakia. Born in Talakia, born in Durban. Um, yeah, we have rights there. So, plenty in the past, plenty to come. Um, moved to Australia, schooled in Maddington, then Gosnells. Went to Curtin eventually, so I slowly moved on up to the east side. Um, one ghetto to another, to another, <laughs> then to Curtin. Been married for 16 years, that is... I don't know how people are married for a long time. Um, it's quite... Taxi. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have I have three boys. Um, I've got a fifteen year old, so I've learned to hate. I hate Snapchat. I hate Instagram. I hate anything that is social media. I spent a month banning him from social media, which meant I spent a month having temper tantrums in my house. Um, I didn't think you could get them from boys, and I wish you could just kick them like you could in the old days. But apparently, that's not something you're allowed to do anymore. Um, so, I don't know, people say you don't have favorite children. Um, I've got ones I hate. <laughs> <laughs> the 15 year old, definitely, definitely. I've learned to hate him over time. Um, and the youngest one, the most evil of them all. Um, Matthew, like, I don't know who's the youngest child in the channel. Did the, all the evil push down to you? Because that's what's happened in my family. Um, and then I've got Aiden, a little lovely kid. <laughs> Much like tax, it's one word. Um, I became part of Sterling Accountants in 2011. Uh, we eventually became the foundation for carbon. Um, don't get confused by this here. I had an app on that journey. Loved it. I used to have the Coleman and everything. Um, and I chose to have my hair like this moving forward. <laughs> um, and mad Wildcats fan. Um, I go to every game. I currently hate my team, um, but that's what it's like if you've been burdened with having a team full of greatness. No other team will follow us. So I don't talk about it. Um, so let's get on to tax. A uh, little bit of an update what's changing. Uh, we've got temporary full expenses. So for those of you who have businesses, which are probably about two thirds of you in the room. Um, temporary full expensing was something that came in during COVID. It allowed us to basically expense everything that we bought. Um, that's gonna end in 2023, subject to the budget change. Um, basically, the assets need to be in place and ready to use. If you've got them in there, you can write it off. Anything that's not a luxury car, or a Google. Um, superannuation changes. Uh, going up again. So those of you who are employees, yay. Those of you who are employers, unlucky. Um, so every year, this is the plan that was put in place a long time ago. It's just going to constantly go for a period of time. And um, the salary sacrifice age limits, they have moved. Well, you can now put money to super up to the age of 75, right? Boom, boom, what, what, what are you doing? Yeah. You're supposed to say yes, guys. Yes. So, yes. I look to you for guidance so that you just turn your back on me. Um, <laughs> So you don't need to pass the works test. In the past, you had to pass the works test. So that's something that you think about. Um, I'll just speak to your friend if you need to know a bit more about that. Um, we talk about downsides, but basically selling and <coughs> chuck a bunch of money in superannuation. I'm sure the booms are talking more about that later on. Uh, working from home deductions have gone up. So previously, you used to be able to claim 52 cents per hour. Working from home during COVID was 80 cents. God, the government are wonderful. Um, so now you can claim a flat rate of 67 cents for every hour you work from home. So those of you that work two hours a week, four hours a week, just ensure that you tell your accountants because we all want to claim that 20 bucks that we get at the end of the year. 
Um, and you can still appreciate specific items like chairs and such. Uh, what you can't do now is some of the other telephone lines and stuff like that. Um, this is a big one that's come up more recently. Um, electric vehicles. If you're planning on offering this service to your staff, please bring it up with us before you do so. Um, but effectively, what it's allowed you to do is salary sacrifice electric vehicles that are up to $85,000, um, as long as they fit into certain criteria. Um, Teslas are generally okay, but they're generally more than $85,000, so don't necessarily go buy one of them. It takes into account all the costs that are associated with bringing in as well. So. If you're an employee, check with your employer if you're planning on doing any sort of electric car purchase in the future. The idea behind this is we're trying to go green, so this is the idea of where the companies are. Um, we've been dealing with a lot of audits in the last year. So the reason for that is a couple of budgets ago, um, the ATO and the government said, oh, we're going to give you all this money for COVID. Then the last budget, they said, oh, we gave everyone too much money for COVID. So now we want to get some of it back. So they pumped a whole bunch of money into their audit division. Um, so now we're starting to see things that have been around, sort of in the background, but now the changed interpretations of the public things that they've done in the past. Um, so section 100A, don't really need to know much about the actual section. All you really need to know is that if you have a trust and you utilize children in the past, um, this could be problematic. Definitely can't do it in the future unless you're planning on giving the physical money to those children. Um, there's also other things like distributing to companies and such. If you're shifting the cash, fine, no issues at all. If you're not going to do that and you're going to do the old accountant says, you know, I pay for my school's education, my kids' education, that's not going to apply. Um, the targeted cash economy, I've been through a couple of audits now where they're comparing FPOS receipts to what they think the industry averages are for particular industries. So what I'm dealing with now is a restaurant where the only sales were from FPOS receipts. And they said, that's probably not right. I'm sure you took some cash. So that's forced them to go back and compare it to their sales data. And then from there, you realize that, yeah, they did take some cash and did their house up. Um, so <laughs> that sort of stuff's gonna be problematic. They've got more access to information than they've ever had in the past. That in mind, crypto, um, if you're on any wallets that are sort of Australian based or even major providers, they know everything about your transactions already. So if you're making money in crypto, chances are it's going to be flagged and they're going to ask you questions about it. Um, professional services, so that's like myself, lawyers, engineers, um, anyone in professional services, we're heavily being targeted at the moment. Um, what they're trying to do is get as much income into that the core individual's names. So they've brought in place new criteria and new methods of assessing whether or not they feel you're distributing too much money to other areas. Um, so that was a massive tax flag opportunity in the past. We've distributed to bucket companies, we've distributed to family members that aren't earning as much. Now they're asking us to go through and work out whether or not that's actually still valid. Um, I get it from the ATO's point of view. 30 years ago, um, doctors used to set up partnerships Accountants used to set up partnerships and everyone was taxed in their own name. Um, we kind of went away from that set of companies, set of trust. I distribute to my son. Um, Pickles, mate? No, no, no. It's got to be worth And so they're trying to stop that sort of action. Uh, Division 7A, they're just changing and tweaking the rules of that a little bit more. Um, and again, they've got access to more information. Division 7A is you taking money out of the company. Um, but not fire a dividend or a wage, it's just you pulling money out of the company and not paying tax on it in your own name. It's something that the ATO don't like, so they ask you to put in a loan agreement, or they're now looking at those loan agreements <coughs> for those terms. Um, big one is JobKeeper and cash flow boost. Obviously, we gave a lot of money to a lot of businesses during COVID. Some probably weren't entitled to that money, so there's been a lot of give us your proof. Um, in the last couple of months. Um, workers' compensation is one I've seen recently where they've gone back 10 years and looked and compared your premium payments to whether or not you have staff. So anyone that doesn't have workers' compensation, just know they're looking back the last five years at the moment. 
and actually comparing. So if you run into any of those situations where you want to talk about your insurances, Mark's over there. Um, he's probably been through a couple of those as well, and he'll tell you the dangers of getting caught in that trap. It's about five thousand dollars first per year, right? Per employee. Yeah, per employee per year. So you mess up one employee, five thousand dollars. You mess up two employees, ten thousand dollars each year, and they generally pick you up for four or five years in a row. So the fines can get quite expensive. Um, lifestyle assets is another one. So at the moment, if you buy a car that's worth more than sixty-five thousand dollars, or you buy a boat worth more than $100,000 and you insure it, the insurance company tells the ATO. So just understand that if you buy these things in, I don't know, a company, um, the ATO are probably going to ask you questions about whether or not that is a personal asset or whether that is a business asset. Um, and we'll see a couple of ones. And then the last one, which we touched upon because this is a property seminar, uh, property transactions, the ATO. I'm now getting fed that information in real time. Um, so the day you sign a contract is the day you've made a sale, the day you made a purchase, not necessarily settlement day. So even if your settlement is three months, the day you sign that contract, it's done and dusted and you have a capital gains event. So the ATO are now asking us to provide that information and giving us some of the information. I'm dealing with one now where um, they didn't put it on the information that we get given, but they ordered it client immediately before the refund was given. Um, so they are seeing that. All right. So what's important here is we've got to be able to structure our investments in a way that is tax effective. So being tax effective is, is trying to put it into an environment where you're paying less tax than a dollar. Um, and you've got to understand the reason behind why you're doing what you're doing. So first thing is your intention. You're trying to make a quick buck, you're trying to you know, hold on and retire with that money, you're trying to pass it on to your kids, which is why I got over the ES fan. Um, you have to consider the consequences of all these transactions and what it is you're doing. Um, ideally, we'd love to be able to spread the tax amongst multiple people. Um, you bring in one person into your family structure um, that has no income, chances are you can save about $10,000 in the tax pool when you make money on any of these sorts of investments. So also taking into account that 108 thing that I talked about. Um, so it's important to plan this appropriately and you've got to plan it probably from the purchase date. So ensuring you buy the assets in the right structure is very important at the start. When it comes to property, if you mess that up and you want to move it later, stamp duty. So you just got to be careful of that. Um, so if you want to personally own assets, you've got to make, you've got to take into account whether or not it's going to be joint tenants, tenants in common. Um, how many people do you want to involve in that transaction? Is it just going to be husband and wife? Is it going to be two families? How do you want to structure that? Um, and then what happens if you want to bring in someone new? Can you do that when you buy a person? Chances are not. There's some stamp duty associated with that. Um, how do you structure the borrowing so that the right people get the right levels of production. So we see a lot of situations where one family member makes more than the other, so therefore they've structured the loan in their name and they've structured the property in their name to, to enable them to get a better tax deduction, negative gearing. Um, so making sure that you structure in a way that's going to work for you guys. Um, generally speaking, when you're negatively gearing, it works best to hold it in the individual way. Um, I'll go into a little bit more in the next few slides, but Trusts and companies, losses get soaked up in there. You can't utilize them until such time as you're making money. So if you want to take advantage of negative gearing immediately, which most people want to, because they want the tax benefit of it, individual rent is not the way to go to property. All right, so, is Tom here? Tom's not here. Um, when I first started, we had a um, business partner that I worked with drew this truck for me to explain trust. Um, it's a very crude picture. Um, over time, we've made it a little bit better, but it shows you everyone's role within the trust. So a trust exists for eight years, and it is an entity that allows you to buy assets on behalf of the <coughs> beneficiaries, generally a family. Um, a trustee is separate to, or can be separate to the beneficiaries, generally speaking, with the company in there. Um, and the idea is that it utilizes the assets, so there's some assets, some assets uh, to create income. So if you were to use this sort of structure, 
the important parts are that you're working for the beneficiaries, so you're working for the whole family group, so you buy a property in there, the whole family group might be entitled to said property. If you want to buy with multiple properties, you might go down the path of a unit trust, which allows you to then segregate and say, this family has half the property, this family has half the property. So understanding how these work is important. What's great about discretionary trusts is you're still entitled to things like um, capital gains discounts. So when you sell a property, if you own it for more than a year, you only pay tax on half of the gain. So owning a trust structure is great because it allows you to distribute to people that have lower income and also you get a discount. Um, companies, a little bit different. So companies have a flat tax rate. It's either going to be 25 or 30 percent depending on what you're doing in there. Uh, taking the cash out can be problematic. So again, we talked about the Division 7 earlier. That's loans, there's issues around that. Um, so you've got to plan that appropriately. Companies are great for investments that are cash-based, or cash-based that don't necessarily grow very fast. Not so great for things where you're expecting high levels of growth. Um, so you want to get a term deposit, great place to look at the company. Um, tax rate's limited to 25%. Um, you don't get the capital gains discount of the company, so that's probably where you lose your most benefit. You don't get that one time. Often what we do is set up combinations of those structures. So if you're running a business, we might have the business in the company. If you're running a unit trust, we might say, well, that's owned by a discretionary trust, we might distribute profits in any given year to a company, um, because that's a lower tax rate. But then when you have your capital gains event, we might distribute to family members, because they might have a better tax outcome in that particular year. So, Again, depending on how much money you think you're going to make on an investment, how many investments you have in there, you might want to change your asset for a little bit and have a combination of all of those sorts of structures. Um, but it all depends on what you're trying to work towards. Are you trying to defer the tax to a later, later period of time? So it might be you defer until you retire, so you might want to set up companies. Or do you want to spread it around multiple people? Or do you set up a trust structure to allow you the option at any given time to distribute to multiple people? Those are very hard to work out without sitting in front of your account and mapping out your whole plan. So it's important to take the time. Um, know your tax liability, right? So tax planning, again, it's paramount. So making decisions on when to sell an asset. You're going to sell it in a high income year versus a low income year. That's going to affect the tax position. It affects your take home at the end of the day. And our job here is to get you as much cash as possible. Um, a lot of time people say, spend money, spend money, that'll reduce tax. Yeah, obviously, yeah, if you spend money, like you can pay an account for a lot of money, and you save taxes on the tax deduction. Um, so that's one great tax planning tool if you guys want to use that one. <laughs> um, or you can do things like deferring income, invoicing at a later date, that might be money. When it comes to property, two core things you need to think about to be able to service the debt. So the taxable income is important. So all those strategies to reduce your income and such, in a year where you buy a property, you might want to switch that up a little bit. And when you go to the bank, they might hate that. Um, and lenders also care about your equity balances as well. So they care about how much the property is worth, what other properties you have, what other assets you have. Um, so when you're going through that exercise, it's important to probably talk to someone it's a broker, such as a Ryan or a Jacob, who are hands up, Ryan and Jacob, yeah, those guys over there. Um, talk to someone like them because they can help you out, work out, especially that equity side, what you're borrowing. Um, so, tax planning can help with that. So, at the end of the day, that's one of the services we sell here. We go for a tax planning activity on a year to year basis with the idea that we're working towards your goals. Um, this is a team. So it's a little bit about what we do. So I'm here, yeah, I run the accounting and tax division, along with Nathan and James, who's around here somewhere, Steve and Michelle, Laura. Um, so we're, we're all around, we, we speak on accounting and tax on a day to day basis, but we also offer other services. Um, today you probably, I chat probably mainly to Ryan and Jake, because property is all about finance. Um, but if you're on a business, feel free to have a chat to Mark as well. 
we started a very small firm, so just going to start myself, Nathan. Fourteen of us when we started. What's that number now? Two nineteen. Right, so um, we're in every state in Australia. We can offer advice on local and over east what's happening over there. So feel free to anything in here, something you want to talk about, grab my ear or grab the partner that you work with and be sure that you're not paying more tax than you should. Thanks a lot. Quite a bit. There's, there's a lot of changes that happened with Super. We all know about it. If you've got any questions, I'll be around. You can ask me. Um, I'm mainly talking about SMSFs and property, how you can acquire them, what I've seen in my um, career. So that's a little bit about me. Oh, just <laughs> I'll talk about it. I'll tell you about it. I'm an accountant. I started my career a long time ago. Um, did tax for a while and then went and did SMSFs. Loved it because I got to talk to clients, got to save them some tax, and back then the rules were quite different. Um, and then I went back and did tax and decided I wanted to specialise in superannuation and self manage just because I saw people who didn't have too much made some really good decisions early in life and set themselves up for success. And then, as we all know, superannuation is a financial product, so I had to do some more study and become a financial planner because one of my passions, when you do get the slides and you can read them, um, is financial literacy. Um, I'm very passionate about this and I can talk a lot about it. Um, it showed me, being in superannuation showed me how you can actually set yourself up from an early age, even if, it's, if you're not young, you can still do it. Um, and I'm very passionate about this topic, so if you ever want to talk about it. Um, I do have to put this disclaimer on. As a financial planner, anything and everything I say today is factual. It has nothing to do with your personal circumstances. It's general in nature. If you do ask me a question, it's going to be general in nature. I'm not allowed to give you personal advice without looking at your full situation. That covers me too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So some of you might have heard of an SMSF, some of you might have one, some of you don't know anything about it. That's a self-managed superannuation fund. Um, it's also sometimes known as a DIY, do-it-yourself super fund. So it's not one of those APRA funds or the, you know, the industry funds you see out there. It's a fund that you own and you look after yourself. Very similar to a trust, but with different rules. So what is it? It's a private super fund. You have full control over it, you manage it, you're the trustee, you're the member, you look after it and take care of it with the help of professionals. This is a great vehicle to grow and build your wealth, but do it right and get it right from the first go. You know, there's um, people go out and do all sorts of things, always seek advice. So the rules changed, before you could only have four members in the self-managed super fund, the rules changed to allow six. And there's a big debate out there. Some people like to have children in there. Some people don't have, don't like to have children in there. We know Clinton won't have his children in there. <laughs> and anyone else's. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right, that's right. But you know, there's strategies there that you can use kids in the fund if you wanted to, and keep them out when they're in. Totally up to you. Is there a minimum age group? No, no, there is no minimum age. And that's the other thing. Um, with the retail fund, I think there is a minimum age, but self-managed. Um, back when I started my career, someone said that they did the analysis it would have changed now. That when a child is born and you put in ten thousand dollars in soup in, into a super fund, mind you, it can't be a concessional, so you can't claim a deduction for it. It's after tax. And the power of compounding and the power of them working and earning a salary, they wouldn't really have to top up their super when they retire at sixty-seven. They will be self-funded. This is the power of compound interest with a low tax rate. So I always say corporate trustees. People like to be trustees themselves individually. We like to have corporate trustees, a company looking after your self-managed super fund, protects you all around. And the other tip that I give everyone is when you do set up a self-managed super fund, think of really cool names. Think of something really great. Don't have it Prunum SMSF. Because people now search for names, you know, all of the names come up. Try and keep it something different. I've seen all sorts of weird and wonderful names. It's time to be creative. These are a few of the advantages and disadvantages of an SMSF. The big one is control. You have control over your fund. You can buy things you like. You can invest in things you believe in. 
that is property. This is a property seminar. So we'll talk a bit about property and how you can do that. But you know, you have access to different investments. Um, one of them is a startup, and I'll tell you a quick story. Um, when I started as a grad, well, when I was think two or three years into my career, and I remember looking at a super fund, and um, the gentleman had put $2,000 and given it to the neighbor. His neighbor was an IT geek and just wanted to start this company and decided he wanted money, and no one would give him the money, and this guy said, okay, here you go. I did the accounts two years later, and that fund was worth $20 million. <laughs> because this kid built an app or something and sold it to the real estate people. I don't know, you probably know more about it. And I thought it was a mistake. This is the power. You can't do that with a retail fund. You can do that with your own fund. Um, there is rules, always seek advice. That's for example. Property, that's a great one. If you have a business, you can actually buy a property in your self-managed super fund and lease it to your business. Why wouldn't you do that? I mean, you're funding your retirement. You're getting a deduction at the 25, 30% or whatever percent you have out there. And your super fund's paying tax at 15% and if you're retired, it's zero. Why wouldn't you do this? Rather than funding my retirement, you can fund your own. So these are some advantages. There's some disadvantages and you would have read about it. Costs. Costs is a huge one. So um, you would have read, so ASIC did a paper and they came up with the $200,000 mark. And the reason they said this was once you have $200,000, a self-made super fund can compete with your retail funds. Once you're over 500,000, it is way more cost effective. Now this depends again, I have to put a caveat, depending on what you have in there and if you've got a financial planner managing your investments or you're doing half and half, but it's quite a good vehicle. The reason I say this is with self-managed super funds and looking after them and the accounting that you do for it and the advice you get for it is generally, and I say generally because people charge differently, it's not percentage based. You could have a million dollar property in there or a five million dollar property there, your fees is not gonna be that much different. Where in a retail fund, it's a percentage of what you have in there. So that's something that you've got to be careful of. Trustees are responsible. So you actually go to the bank and get a bank account. You have access to that money. So you're responsible and it is your job not to touch that money and save it for your retirement. Because this is the biggest mistake I see people, especially business owners going, oh, I need a bit of cash, I'll just take it out from here. Don't do that. Come speak to me and I'll tell you how we can do it legally. Um, and then, you know, compensation schemes, because you're the trustee and you're going to sue yourself and you need time and skills. It is your own, you will need to manage it yourself. The APRA regulated funds are managed by someone else, you're not the trustees, with the self-managed super fund you are. So one of the biggest questions and one of the biggest things I do is set up self-managed super funds for people to buy property. So can your self-managed super fund, which we will call SMSFs, so self-managed um, own property and how? So yes, it can. You can have residential property, you can have commercial property, and you can have farmland. And there is rules, as you can see there, with residential property, you can have residential property into, in your self-managed super fund as an investment. You cannot live in it. No one related to you can live in it. The relationship net is quite wide. Includes, includes ex-spouses as well, so be careful. But the one that a lot of people get caught out with includes people that are not related as a blood relation or through marriage, is partnerships. If you've been in a partnership with someone and you're not related in a normal sense, you will be put together for superannuation rules as a related party. So if I went there and you know Jenny, I came and I said, oh, great presentation, let's go buy a property together. We don't know each other. But we buy a property together, that is a partnership. We are now related parties. So just be careful about that. So you cannot lease it out, rent it out to anyone related to you. You can rent it out, you can rent it out to me. I'm not related to you. You can rent it out to me. And I can rent it out like to employees. As long as they're not related to you. Maybe because you're paying their super. No problem, no problem at all. You can, you can um, lease it out or rent it out to a friend. Commercial property, that's different. You can lease it out to a third party, obviously, but you can lease it out to your own business. So there's a, there's a big exception there, so just be mindful, talk a little bit about it, as long as it's wholly and exclusively used to produce business income. So I can actually buy a property in my self-managed super fund, 
my business can rent it out. You can see how this is such a win-win situation. And then farmland, this is another one we see mostly. So again, farmland is something that is considered real business property. You can own this in your super fund. You can lease it out to someone else, or you can lease it out to yourself. Now, can my SMSF buy property, or can my, you know, who, who can you buy this from? So I, I've got this question quite often lately, saying, oh, I did a, you know, I went to a restructuring thing, and, I, and people said to have property in SMSFs, and it's, it's really good. I've got this residential property in my name or in a trust, and I want to move it into the SMSF. Can I do it? So if there's one thing you can remember, the rules with super are if you own something, your trust owns something, your company owns something, or anyone related to you owns something, you are not allowed to sell that to your super fund. Except for, and I say this to all my grads, there's always no's, 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 but the best part about super law is there's always an exception. So you generally can do things, it depends how much you want to pay for it or what you want to do, but you can. So the exception, is you can't buy anything from yourself or anyone related to you except for commercial property and listed securities. There is a few others, but those are the main ones. So just remember that as we go through the presentation. So who can you buy these properties from? It's residential, unfortunately you can't buy it from yourself. You can buy it from me if I'm not related to you, no problem, as long as you pay market. Commercial property, this one you can buy from yourself. So if you have structured yourself incorrectly or you think it's time to move it into a self-managed super fund for some reason or some, you know, sometimes you have things in your own name, you can do this. Be wary of capital gains tax, stamp duty and all sorts of things. We can always advise you on that. That is allowed as long as it's, it's real business property. And farmland, again, it depends. If it is a proper farm and used for business, absolutely. Now remember I said if you've got residential property, you can't live in it, you can't anyone related to you can't live in it, except for if it's a farm, because that's considered purely incidental. So you've got to live in the farm because you're looking after it. So there's different rules there. And again, if you're in a situation, we've got to look at every situation as it is. If it's not a farm being used for business and it's just one of those holiday farms or whatever, it needs to be leased out to someone who's not related to you. As long as you're generating business income, okay for you to lease it. If you're not, you can't. talked about this, so just remember, I harp on about this because so many times I see people going, I've got this great property and my daughter wants to live in it, can't she? No. <laughs> or, you know, all sorts of things. I've got this holiday home and then I look at the log book and they've lived in there like they've stayed there so many times and I'm like, why didn't you just use my name? <laughs> so just be careful. So just be careful about that. So how can your SMSF or your super fund acquire property? Because property values are going up. Maybe not, I don't know, we'll find out soon. <laughs> and sometimes we don't have enough in super. You know, we didn't put enough, we didn't top it up, we didn't come to a great presentation telling us how amazing super was. Um, we were the primary caregivers. Whatever the reason, we might not have enough. How are you able to put property into the fund? There's other ways, but the four main ways are directly, you have cash, and you buy the property, just like you would anything else. A geared trust, we'll talk about all of these in a minute, which is a borrowing in a trust that's non-related. Because a big thing with super is related parties. An ungeared trust, or a limited recourse borrowing arrangement, which is the borrowing in the super fund you might have read about, which is also called an NRB. Directly, pretty easy, set up a self-made super fund, roll your money in there, you've got cash, you've got enough, you've got 500,000, buy a property, 500,000, done deal, easy peasy. You know, if you've got land and you, you can build on it, you can do all sorts of things as long as there's no borrowing in there. It's probably the easiest way, if you can. Um, things to be careful, the offer and acceptance is you're always in the name of the trustee as trustee for the superannuation fund. Just get that right. But it's pretty easy. And you can enhance the property. You can put it on the story. You can change it. You can it's residential. You can change it to business. It's, it's, quite, it's quite good. Then we have the geared trust. This is a great one if you are in partnership or you know someone or you trust someone and you want to buy property together and you're not related. So you can set up a trust and put a property in there and the property trust can borrow. 
and your super fund can buy units in that trust only if it's unrelated. If you're related, it's considered an investment in a rela related party and it's not allowed. So we could go and set up a fund, a trust, gear it up and, and a super fund. So you don't have to go down the limited recourse borrowing path. You just buy units and away we go. I see this a lot with business partners or you know, people who just have the money outside or want to do it without going down the limited recourse borrowing arrangement. Because even though we do a lot of those, they can be quite a bit of work involved. So the super fund pays cash, but doesn't get the property, just gets the units, just like you would any other way. The other one is an ungeared trust. Now remember I said, you're not allowed to invest in anything, or buy anything from yourself, or you can't invest in anything that you're a related party in, that's not listed security or commercial property, except for ungeared trusts. So this is where you can set up a trust. Your family trust can own units in that trust and your super fund can own units in that trust. Generally, if you think about what I've said, that's a related party because you're 100%, it's related to you. There's an exception for this and this is, you've got to be really careful because if you get this wrong, you can get tainted and you can just blow it out. Why would people do this and why do people do this? So people do this generally for two reasons. Number one, they don't have enough in the self-managed super fund and they, 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 they can't borrow enough to buy the property. So, but they've got cash outside with either family members or their other entities. So what you do is you set up the trust, the super fund buys units, the trust has no gearing, but the other entity that's buying the other units, which is related to you, can go out and borrow and buy, because there's nothing restricting trusts companies and your individuals to borrow to buy units it's the super fund that can't borrow and then what you do or what clients do is because of this it allows you to buy a property with your super fund and as a super fund gets cash you can sell units to the super fund and it will not remember how i said you can't sell things to yourself this is the exception you can slowly drip feed units to yourself in the self-made super fund until it's 100 percent owned by the fund Again, be wary of capital gains tax and um, transfer duty. This is an option. The other one is you can actually enhance the property. So property developing, you can actually do that. So with a limited recourse borrowing, as we'll see in, in the next slide, you can't change the nature of the asset. If you buy a property, if you buy land, and you borrow to buy that land, you can't build on it until the loan is extinguished. With something like this, you can. So it's something to be wary of, obviously, look at the situation. Um, so this is a great one and it's something that you can use and I have used multiple times and you've got to get it right. Limited recourse borrowing arrangements, which is quite popular and it's quite good. You, know, you can get what you want. You can do this for residential property, commercial property and farms. Uh, pretty much all it is, it's a little bit tricky because you've got to set up four entities. You've got to set up the corporate trustee for the SMSF You've got to set up the SMSF, which is a trust. Then you have to set up another company. I always say have a company to keep things separate and keep them safe. And then you have a bear trust. The only entity that prepares a tax return and accounting is the SMSF. The other companies don't. They just sit there. So this structure is quite good. So if you've got $200,000 in your super and you want to buy a $500,000 property, you can go to the bank and you can borrow it through to and the finance brokers will tell you if you can, you can't, whatever, but generally that's how it works. Um, it's, you've got to get advice on this because you've got to be cash flow projections. As we know, gearing can be quite risky. You've got to make sure that's it. You've got to, your deed, the deed is the governing rule for super. It should allow for it. Generally, most of the new ones do, but just check. Investment strategy. Why are we buying property? Property is un, in, not a liquid asset. It's not saying you can't do it, you need to have some logical reasoning on why you want to do this. And it must be a single acquirable asset. So what this means is if you went out and bought a property, a commercial property, say, with a borrowing, and you had a parking lot, and you had the property, and they were in two separate titles, you will need two separate bear trusts to own that land. 
You can't have it all in one. That's what it means, a single acquirable. If you didn't have a loan and you just bought, bought it with cash, no problem at all. Any of the other structures, no problem at all. With an LRBA, single acquirable asset. It just has to be on one title. If you buy another one, you just have to set up another trust. So you're just setting up lots of bear trusts. So just be mindful of that. So you only acquire the property, not the fittings and furniture. The offer and acceptance, this is another one that catches a lot of people. You've got to get this right. And it's a bit of a mouthful, but you have to get it right to avoid the stamp duty. So when you go out, remember you've got an SMSF, a corporate trustee, a bear trust, and a bear trustee, right? When you go and put, so this is say the structure is set up, and in WA you need to have this set up before you actually put your offer and acceptance. So please just be mindful of that. Let's set it up first. Um, the offer and acceptance has to say the name of the bear trustee as bear trustee for the trustee of the SMSF. So you can see it could be quite a mouthful. So, so when I said be creative with your names, if you're gonna if you're gonna have something like this, try and keep them short because it can be a mouthful. Bear trustee as bear trustee for the trustee for the SMSF. And the reason we do this is the bear trust holds it for the fund until the loan is there. And the reason this is, superannuation has something called a sole purpose. And the sole purpose is to provide retirement benefits. So the government doesn't want you if, you, if you're not able to service this loan, no one can touch anything else that you might have in super. It's only that property, whether it's gone down. So generally, they'll come for everything. With a limited recourse, it's limited to that property. If you've got you know, some great shares in there and other bits and pieces, no one can touch it, no one can touch them. And the title on the um, property, on the real estate, on the, on the document will say the bear trust name. So it's really important to get it right because when the loan is extinguished, when we don't have a loan anymore, that property is then transferred into the self-managed super fund and the name is changed. If you've got the name wrong, you can be hit with double stamp duty. So just make sure that's right. And the SMSF cannot change the nature of the property. So if it is a borrowing and you did buy land, you want to build on it, you're changing the nature of the property, you're not allowed to do that until the loan is paid off. You can see why the other structures are quite valuable. There are some lenders, which I might not be new or might not be, I'm not sure, um, but the brokers will let you know. But these are the lenders there. As we know, the big banks pulled out, I still think they're out, yeah, they don't do lending anymore. But there's lots of different options and some really, really good deals have come out, so to make sure you talk to the guys. Um, that's just the name of some of them. The other one that I just want to touch on is related party borrowings. I've done a couple of these, and this is where, remember how I said you can't do stuff yourself to the super fund, lend to it, buy things from it, whatever, except for a limited recourse borrowing arrangement. So if you've got some rich grandparents, or you've got some rich parents, or you've got some rich you know, relatives, or you're rich yourself, um, you've got com a company that's got money in it, you've got a trust that's got money in it, and you know you want to do something with it. You know, Clinton said don't put um, things that are going to grow up in value in, in your trust, in your companies, because you don't get your capital gains discount. If you've got money sitting in there, another option, and this is a caveat, there might be Division 7A and all that stuff, but again, talk to advisors. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can lend money to yourself to your super fund to buy property. So there's nothing saying you can't. If you've got the money or you know someone who's got the money, you can do this. You can borrow outside and lend money to the super fund or you can borrow money from someone else. There is something called the safe harbor rules the ATO has put out. You've got to make sure everything is there. You can only have the loan maximum 15 years, whereas generally you can have it up to 30 years. The Back in the day when interest rates weren't too high, the interest rate on this was higher than what the banks were giving you. Right now it's pretty good, it's 5.3% I think it is, and the banks might be 7, so it's another option. Um, and you just gotta get it right, so there's lots of different rules in there, we just gotta tick them off, but you can, and we're seeing this quite often. Borrow right outside, don't have the whole structure in there, and, 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 and do it this way, and have the borrowing outside, because as we know, when you borrow for an SMSF, you've got a, um, you know, a higher LVR, um, it's a higher interest rate. So it's just something to be mindful of. Risks with borrowing, as they are with anywhere, anywhere else you borrow, 
these interest rates can go up and you can't service the loan. The tenants might not work out. But if you're leasing it to yourself and your business, usually that's mitigated because you're not going to default on that, obviously. Um, contributions into super, we know there's a limit. So if you can't service the loan, there's not enough rent coming through and you've maxed out the caps and you have a bit of a problem, if you need additional money, how are you going to look at it? Um, borrowing can magnify the losses, so just be mindful of that. It's not different to having borrowing anywhere else. Obviously, it's just super, it's protected. Um, so things to note, trusty investment strategy, make sure you've got cash flow, your liquidity, make sure your leases are in order. Everything has to be at arm's length, which means at market. If you're doing things with yourself as a related party in the allowed bits, you need to get third party valuations. They don't have to be sworn valuations. You don't have to pay for them. Um, you can go to a real estate agent who will give you a valuation to tell you what I think the property is worth, what the rent is. So just be mindful of that. Sole purpose, it is for your retirement. You don't want to use it. I had a great case where this client saw this property in Dunsborough. Actually, he's, he's, it was great. It was a few years ago when the properties were in, you know, COVID wasn't there then, the properties were, weren't as high as they were. He bought it in the self paying super fund. A lot of people said, don't do it. He did. Um, had a loan, paid it off, and just recently sold his home in Apple Cross. And, you know, for a lot of money, his home in the super fund was paid off. So what he did, because they're moving to Dunsborough now, and I think the house, he paid 500, I can't remember, it was not a lot, and now it's worth one point something million. And he's just bought it off himself, because you can do that as long as it's market, and they're living in that, in that property. So what a great investment to see in future, if you want to live somewhere in future, because you can do that. The only rule is you got to take it out of super to live in it. I do, I am about to finish. I do have to mention diversification. Because we are talking about property, and we're talking about putting property into super, it is an illiquid asset, so we do need to make sure we diversify. As we're building the super fund up, it's got cash in there, we need to look at, you know, complementing it with shares and things like that, that will actually enhance your income. So there's something really, really great that the government has called the government co-contribution. So if you have young kids that are working part-time, or you have primary caregivers, or people that are part-time retired, and they're earn under $48,000. If you put $1,000 into super, the government puts $500 into super. Power of compounding, in 10 years time, just that amount is worth 25 grand. So just, just be mindful of things and you know, low tax rate. So diversify, franking credits are great. They can reduce your tax within the fund even though it's taxed at 15%. The thing that I didn't say is superannuation is taxed at 15%. Yes, we know the $3 million limit you know, the government's looking at changing all of that. But currently it's 15%. And if you're retired and in pension phase and have less than 1.9, 1.7, 1.9 next year, you pay nothing, zero tax. So it's pretty good. Thank you. So, hey guys, my name's Lachlan. We've got a couple of team members here on. About 40 years, our homeboy and expert. And Tim's come on to the team this week. So welcome to the the crew today we'll talk mostly about Perth. I know um, everyone here wants to probably know more about Perth and East Coast, but it's important to give reference on what the rest of the country is doing as well. Um, so I'll spend a bit of time there. I'll finish off with some more investment principles that we do as a business. Our business is building our portfolios. Uh, we've got a buyer's agency, we do have a property management arm as well. And then a little bit of commercial update and what's happening sort of in the home buying space as well. You guys can't see, but you've seen it before, so I'm blocking it here. Keep with me. So, um, on a macro level, you're only as good as your, your track record. Who attended the one, the seminar here in 2020? No, you guys would have. I had June, I think it was October. And post that, there was a lot of uncertainty. And I think probably a lot of people in the room thought we're probably full of shit and very bullish on the markets that we suggested. So, COVID had hit. CBA predicted there's going to be 30 to 40% declines over the next two years. We certainly were pushing that property prices were going to go up by 30 or 40%. But our view was to hold, don't be selling properties in a time of uncertainty. Not too dissimilar to now, what's happened over the last six months. We shouldn't be selling property when there's uncertainty in the market. Uncertainty brings about opportunities, which we're seeing at the moment. So it's why I use this as we're in a similar time to where we were potentially two years ago, just because the interest rates have created an environment of uncertainty. 
Our calls were during this time that we're buying Perth, Adelaide, and Brisbane. Um, they were our key macro markets. From our regionals, we're looking Bendigo, Ballarat, and uh, we were starting to get exposure into Toowoomba. Fast track to where we are today, from the start to, to COVID to, to where we are now, markets are progressive the cycle. So look at leading performers, Adelaide was from the start to finish of COVID did about 45%. Um, Brisbane did 39%. Our regionals were the, probably nearly the best performance, being on Ballarat, both did 40%. Very, markets very much following the same sort of algorithm. Uh, Toowoomba up 27%, Perth did about 22%. Sydney was one that you could argue that we potentially got wrong at, at the time. When you look at, we said, certainly weren't interested in buying in Melbourne or Sydney. So mid-COVID, the back end of COVID, clients particularly in Melbourne saying, why didn't we get into Sydney? I think we fast-tracked where we are today, we're pretty thankful we didn't get into Sydney. Because at the time, it was still very unaffordable, which I'll show you at the moment. Where we are now, so some of these markets have corrected, um, most notably Sydney. Um, so from the start of COVID to where we are, that's where the median house prices are. Adelaide's still the top performer at 36%. Brisbane went on a significant run, but was sort of hindered a little bit by the land tax reform. You may have heard about, they're essentially going to tax anyone that owned property nationally in Queensland. So it took a lot of the investment out of that market before interest rates went up, so it had a bit of a double kick. So I think Brisbane will still represent an opportunity once we see the levelling out of interest rates, which I believe um, we are at that point at the moment. But um, median house prices, as you can see, Sydney still leading the race, and Perth still very affordable, um, even after, you know, I get asked all the time, is Perth at the top of the cycle after 22% growth? Certainly not. It's still very affordable in comparison to where the other markets are in Australia. Um, so it's good to keep in mind, considering Hobart's still at 660,000 uh, close online. In terms of the cash rate versus the inflation rate, I don't think I need to spend too much time because we know the cost of money has gone up. So what is important to highlight is that money is still very cheap, even if interest rates aren't to, to come off. I don't know if anyone listens to Bill Evans, Westpac, he's forecasted seven rate reductions next year, which is a bold strategy. He's the one who also said the market's going to fall by 30 to 40% during COVID. So, you can read into what you will. I said at a presentation at containing last week, if interest rates go up next month, I'll, I'll buy everyone a pint. I'll uh, second that, but Nathan said he'll buy everyone a pint here. So, <laughs> all chips on that they won't. And that was last week when it wasn't as certain futures hadn't really come out with their forecast. So it was a ballsier call last week than it is this week. But I'm, I'm confident this is leveled out. Whether there's still another rate rise in the next three or four months, um, I won't go on to say I'll buy your pint under that situation. But certainly we're starting to see this level off and you know, once they do level off, there is going to be rate reductions at some point, whether that's later this year, early next year, or mid next year. Um, we'll start to see inflation come down and obviously interest rates come down. But regardless, money's still very cheap in comparison to where it has been in the past, and that's important to know. And once we do get a tackle on inflation, we're going to see interest rates. It's really the only mechanism we've got um, to change behaviour. <coughs> Sentiment. And the newspapers will dictate movements in markets. It's it's never as bad as what the media reports, never as good as what the media report. Yeah, and the media much media pretty much drove you know, 20 to 25 percent of the last Sydney boom cycle was the fact that once they get on a rampage, a lot of journalists obviously own property in, in Sydney because that FOMO starts to drive drive prices. But the same is true when things aren't going as well. If you read the fin or any sort of news up article outlets or anything like that, you'll just see negativity across the board and, and Perth can get sucked into that because you're, most people who feel like me, you look at the headline, if it's not in property, obviously I dig the deal when it's property related, but anything else I sort of read headlines and you can sort of make an opinion on that and unfortunately headlines are very negative, so it does have an impact on the Perth market. But they're negative for a reason and we still have concerns about the national market, um, but it's important to note that all markets should be looked at in isolation. But from a macro level, the reason we've got such concerns is because there's still a really uh, big problem with affordability in Sydney and Melbourne. So this is where the affordability index got to uh, late last year, it was at 75%. So the affordability index looks at the average wage consumed by the average mortgage. So assuming their variable rate. So essentially, late last year, if you were to go into a variable rate, 75% of the average wage was getting consumed by the mortgage. What does that mean? It means you have to sell your property. There's no way in any scenario can you afford 75% of your paycheck just to go to the mortgage. 
So what has to happen? Interest rates have to come off to make it more affordable. Wages have to go up, which takes time. More prices fall. So what we've seen, we've seen a negative 12% decline in the market. As we stand here today, that market's still at 66%, even after a 12% decline. And there's still an argument to say that money may not get cheaper in the short term. There's still maybe a rate rise. So it's even going to put more pressure on that. And if we look at historically where Sydney's been, it's never been higher than 67%. Comfortability is around 50% where the market becomes you know, accepted as affordable and you can start to see some consistency in the data. So at 66%, we've still got huge concerns with the market. For that to get down into the 50s, we're going to have to see another 10% decline, which would be a 22% reduction in house prices over the last 18 months, which would be the biggest fall in house prices in Sydney ever. Could that represent an opportunity? Potentially. But again, plenty of reporting on this, and we're going to see more of this come to light in the papers when you start to see it's 800,000 loads going from fixed to variable. So there's going to be some mortgage show and some mortgage stress, particularly those who born in Sydney, you know, middle of the COVID bubble. If we look at Melbourne, our concerns aren't as great in terms of price falls, but that's because it's, the affordability problem is not as big of an issue. Affordability highs at about 50%, 52% is where it got to late last year, so it broke a record for affordability. And that's what we're looking at. Where's a historical ceiling? That's important to know. That gives a demonstration of where markets can get to before they're uncomfortable. So at 47%, look, it's still very unaffordable. Uh, this market sort of sits at about 39% when it's at an affordable or comfortable level. So we're a long way from that. So we are still probably forecasting some, some price declines in the Melbourne market. Brisbane, like I said, uh, there's still affordable affordability in the market. So once interest rates level out and there's confidence back in the market, I think we'll see further growth in both Adelaide and Brisbane. Um, but as you'll see, Perth is, is going to be you know, tainted as, as the most affordable market and therefore with the potential of the most upside at 29%. So historically, back from you know, the booms, we've got as high as 56% in 2006. So we're sort of just over halfway there from our affordability ceiling. So that's what everyone talks about. If you read local papers that we don't have an affordability problem here. Our wages are the second highest in the country behind Canberra, and our house prices are, are the lowest. So, hence why we haven't seen the pain in the market over the last six to nine months. Everyone's like, well, how is Perth holding? How's it holding? Which gives us confidence once interest rates level out and come off, and there's confidence back in the market, we're going to start to see some pretty serious growth in the market. But yeah, that, hence why the market is holding. So, when we look at Perth, um, it's a different news story here. In, and so who's been on home over the last three weeks? Raise your hand if you've been out looking around. Yeah, it's a bloodbath, it's a frenzy. <laughs> so you read the paper, the markets are falling, interest rates are going up, it's for the crisis, all these loans are going fixed, variable. And I was just speaking to someone who said we're trying to buy a property in Dunkirk, it's like good luck, there's 40 people at home open, 12 offers. The agent hasn't given you a call back in three weeks. It's, it's got the sort of makings of a very hot market, but you're reading the papers and it's, it's just not coming short. So, we do believe that it is a different story here, and like I said, once there's confidence back in the market, it's hard now when there's arguably, you know, if you speak to agents, you can start to convince them that the market's going to fall. Um, and they just read you know, Sydney headline media and what agents are doing over there. But it's finally difficult to transact in a soft market. Give it 12 months, I think we're going to um, be in quite the uh, predicament. So this is the cash rate um, correlated with median house prices over the long term. So the green lights just the cash rate which I've showed before, median house prices um, since 1990. Why I show this is because everyone talks about when money becomes more expensive, house prices must come off, like you've seen in Sydney and Melbourne, and when money becomes cheaper, house prices go on the run. Go on the run. Perth has never operated under that model. It's actually done the opposite. When we look back to the, the 90s boom, when we've seen 100% growth between 92 and 2000, that was during a rising interest rate environment. Same true throughout this boom, yes you can argue it was a mining boom, but interest rates went from 5% to 7.5%. At the same time prices went up by, well they tripled over that, that six year window. And then the same was true when cash rate went from 5% to essentially zero. Prices should have gone up. I've been in Perth, I've been in 11 years now. Pretty much that whole time we said no growth. So it, it hasn't correlated with the cash rate because there are other metrics, other drivers that, that carry more weight, weight locally than just the cost of money. It's employment, it's jobs, fundamentally, it's population growth, as well as supply. If you look at the correlation of that, and we're clearly in the supply at the moment, which I'll, I'll demonstrate to you shortly. So where we sort of net out what Perth's done, we look at some, some clear defining periods. 
blue, blue areas of growth followed by the correction periods in grey. And very distinct, if you look at Perth in comparison to other markets, the growth is significant. And median house price here from essentially 100,000 to 460 in seven years is pretty significant, followed by pretty long stagnation periods. So in pure Perth, when it does go, it does go very quickly. Um, and it is quite significant, not, call, not calling that sort of growth, but this 22% that we've had over the last couple of years, and, you know, it's, it's very modest in comparison to what we've seen previously. Um, so our view is we're very much at the early phase of this next window of growth. On a summary, what we track, um, so this is our research committee. The research committee gives us the information on a national level to dictate where and where we are buying and selling for clients. And then obviously the local information from the suburb level, what suburbs we believe are outperforming the market. But the key market indicators, supply and demand, affordability, confidence, money supply, investment value and risk. So across the board, very balanced market um, in comparison to other markets, certainly most favourable in the country at the moment. Understand we track the top 30 population centres around Australia. Um, and when looking at these markets, Perth, Rockingham, Mandra, and Toowoomba, um, which is regional Queensland's been our so we're now for Brisbane, uh, are the strongest data sets that we're tracking at the moment. <coughs> so let's go through Perth from a demand equation. What's demand? Demand is population growth. The problem was anyone that was here from 13 through to 20 were losing anywhere from 10 to 15,000 people from west to east, and predominantly due to work and the lack of work here. And um, obviously that, a lot of that population migrated to Queensland and, and New South Wales. Last year we finally got our migrants back, so we had 12,000 people move back to WA or to WA from the East Coast. And we had our first immigration for, for three years, 10,000 people. So in total about 21,000 people moved to WA. The thing about immigration in comparison to births is that when people migrate here for work, they need to live somewhere immediately. So it impacts either the rental market or the purchasing market. And if you listen to the radio today or yesterday or any other day, McGowan is, is constantly pushing migration skilled workers to come to Perth and doesn't recognise we have a housing, housing shortage. So for someone who doesn't understand that, when we've got no more than 1,500 properties available to rent at the moment, we don't have a shortage of property, and you want 30,000 people to move here this year, that, that crisis is going to hit home in about October, November this year. And then when it becomes a problem, by the time we get things pushed through for legislation, we're in the middle of next year and you start building properties, you're three or four years away from actually bringing that supply to life. So the issue is here, I think most people are aware, the government doesn't see it, so, which is exciting for landlords and owners, because you're going to see price growth and rental growth, but it's going to be a real problem. We're going to see a serious shortage of properties. So locally, why are we pushing for, for more skilled workers? It's because locally everyone's got a job, unemployment's record lows. Underemployment, so people who are employed looking for additional work, again, pretty much at, at record lows and trending downwards. But what's more compelling, and this is the, the case of why we're pushing for more migration in WA, is job vacancies are at an all-time high. So a balanced market in terms of across, think of this as SEEK, but across all jobs boards. Your balanced market for Perth historically, just from 2010 to sort of 18, is about 25,000 vacant jobs. We're back up over 60,000. And so for the first time in history, we may get this situation where there's more job vacancies than there are people unemployed, which we've never seen in any market. Um, and as you can see, that gap, I'm not sure what really happened here in 2008, but obviously job vacancies uh, weren't counted for a couple of months, but the gap has always been quite vast, and, and more recently just because we have so many people looking to employ staff, I'm sure anyone in the room um, in any industry is feeling the same pain. So hence we're starting to look overseas and into the East Coast, because wages are going up, and WA wages, as I've said, are higher than anywhere in the country. So we, we're going to see that migration come across. So on the supply side, like I said, the government doesn't recognise that we've got a housing shortage. Um, so we'll properties on the market, days on market are at 15, so that's the orange line. As you can see, they've come off significantly from, from where they were back in 2019 when days on market got close to 90 days. Down to 15, we're not going to really get lower than that. Agents need to get their, you know, need to get on realestate.com and domain and get their face and get their exposure, so that won't get any lower. But stock on market typically sits around, you know, as it got to as high as 16 and a half, 17,000 properties on the market back in 2019. Balanced market about 14 and a half thousand. As of today, there's about 7,500 properties on the market. So less than half of what there was even three years ago. Combine that with the rental market. Like I said, what was available in this space, you know, 
peaked at 7,000 properties available in the rental space. Balance from 2019 sits around six, five and a half, six thousand properties. We're now down to 1,650 properties available in the rental market. So you look at that sort of equation, circa seven and a half, and say round up, look at one and a half in the rental space, and 9,000 available homes, people moving here doesn't go into 30,000 that are coming. Only solution to that is we just need to build more properties, which we aren't. Building approvals are the lowest they've been in the last decade. So we need to be building about 20, 25,000 properties minimum a year. We're on track at the moment, we're building about two and a half a quarter. We're just not building enough. Um, and that's a number of reasons, there's a bit of a COVID boom. Everyone thought there was going to be no supply of stock because of commencements. Anyone who's probably built in the last two years is probably still waiting for that to be completed. So that's going to drag out over, all that stock's not going to come onto the market at the same point in time. It's dragging out now over two, three, unfortunately four years. Um, so this issue of vacancies, so this is the vacancy rate which peaked in 2016 at 5.5%, now down at 0.4 and trending downwards. <coughs> Can't see this going away anytime soon. At the same time, we've seen rents go from $440 a week now up to about $650 a week and rising. We have a property management book, and it's you know, every 12 months, it's you know, how much can you sort of up your rates? There's obviously legalities behind that, so often it's, it's having tough conversations with tenants to move them out because you know you're going to get an extra $150 of, of rent, which is, you, know, you can argue it's brutal or unfair, but I understand a lot of people held properties in Perth for a long period of time and their properties have been under rented. The cost of money is gone, <coughs> people need to increase your yield, so anyone that owns investment property should be trying to put emotion aside and look to increase your, your cash flow. So where we are in summary, like I said, for Perth, you know, hard for people here locally to say that it's still at the bottom of the cycle. Well, we don't think it's at the bottom, but it's, we still think it's very close to. Um, 22% growth that we've seen is is modest in, in what we believe may come over the next three, five, six years, um, based on some of the data that we've just, just presented. Obviously, um, for anyone that wants it, I will share a Perth research report which goes through the 54 data sets. I won't keep you here for those to go through them individually. You can go through them in your own time and or any other markets that you've got interest in. In terms of the runaway, so this is looking at, and it's dangerous to forecast, so we're not forecasting, but this is based on the affordability ceiling. So those affordability index that I showed you at the start, where markets can get to before they become unaffordable, based on the cash rate where it is today, so the likely variable rate at five and a half percent. If these markets are to hit their price ceilings, when confidence comes back into the market, these are the runaways before they become unaffordable. So interest rates stagnate and start to come off early next year. We start to see the markets return with some confidence. Adelaide would have the potential to. 19% growth before it is that ceiling. Brisbane 35%, Canberra 4, Darwin 55, Melbourne 7. Perth prices would have to double. So that's what we so we think the prices are going to double. They would have to double before we hit that ceiling again. Sydney would come out, come off 10%. That's why we think we've got great concerns for Sydney. Fast tracking out, if the shoe cap straight got to 4%, likely variable would be 6.25. Sydney now comes off 17%. So, hence why we don't think it's going to get there because you know, a lot of the decision, decision makers obviously own property on the east coast and that would cause another 17% on what has already been a 12% falling house price and would throw those markets into a housing recession, which is not what anyone wants. Um, investment principles. So, anyone who attended the last seminar has probably touched on this a little bit, but it's just important just because we do have a strong, I suppose, view on the birth market. Um, and it's not to say we didn't two years ago, but we just probably had a stronger view on Adelaide and Brisbane at the time. You know, our focus and attention is solely, and that's not just me because I live in Perth, but the East Coast directive is the same. They're all selling up properties on the East Coast and, and investing here locally. We're starting to see other buyers agencies, which we haven't seen in the last, we really had the market to ourselves for three years. If you listen to the Property Couch or any podcast, which people seem to follow as gospel, they're very pro-Perth. So that just sort of starts to linger around and we're finding we're missing out often now from East Coast buyers, which I think will be the next wave of activity. But it doesn't mean just go out there and buy a property tomorrow and expect it to be offering value, because there's a lot of things that can go wrong. And that's sort of where you need to be very strategic, make sure you've got a strategy that's going to underpin your investment and or home. Home purchase, it's important. But suburb selection is critical as well. You know, there's 306 suburbs in, in Perth last time I checked. That was 12 months ago, I'm sure there's got more now. We're buying in 37 of these suburbs. It's not buying everywhere, we've got a very 
pointed approach based on the research that we track. Um, so you can do a plan and if you need nothing else, I know it's understanding it can be difficult to track days on market, stock on market, vacancy rates across the board, trying to collerate uh, established dwellings versus units, those sorts of things can be a little bit tiring, but if you look at infrastructure spending, school catchment, zoning changes and average incomes, just as a baseline, you're well on the way to finding some of the you know, better performing suburbs across the board. In terms of the asset quality or the asset type, um, keep it very simple. Land values is typically what goes up in value, not improvements. Improvements can. If you go buy something that's brand new and 90% of the values in the improvements, not the, not the land, you'll find like a new car, unless there's a significant uplifting value from land prices, you're going to start to see discounting on that asset. So ideally we want quality homes with 70% of the values in the land. Um, we, we don't buy our land packages, apartments, typically don't buy high density units and anything that's compromised. And when I say compromised, it's any of these issues really. Most commonly we find is adjoining uses, so understanding the neighbours essentially, making sure you're not running into commercial uses. Commonly you see at the moment a lot of childcare development. Understand when, 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 that, when that can't be built is really important. You know, spend a million bucks on a home, it's going to be a family home next door that's knocked down and if you've got 100 kids getting dropped off every day, that's going to, you know, when you go to sell a problem, property, you're not going to sell it for what you paid for it. <coughs> Same with commercial or apartment use, you might have you know, bought a property recently and knocked down the rear or something adjoining and, and then build a six or seven storey complex, you know, shattering privacy issues. Just knowing what you're buying and where you're buying, what, what can and can't be done is important. Social housing, yeah, we don't want to draw stigma to that, it's an important part of the housing cycle, but it's knowing where it is, knowing who your neighbours are, because the end buyer, which if you're buying a quality home, it's probably going to be an emotional home buyer, and that's what we want, right? We don't want to buy investment properties to sell back to an investor, because they're going to pick the ice through and try to get it for the lowest price. We want to buy quality homes, so when you sell it in five years, an emotional home buyer comes through and says, I don't care what I can pay for it, I'm buying this property. But what they won't compromise on is what a neighbour property is like, what a street appeal is like. If there's a history of problems in that spread, they're probably not going to cut a premium for your property. So understanding that, flooding, although in Perth you think we'd have an issue, if you're in a flood zone, which there's plenty of zones in Perth, and down south and, and up north, it's insurance premiums potentially double based on what's happened on the East Coast. We've seen this recently, just insurance has been going up a lot, so just knowing where that is, what that looks like. Um, flight paths, moisture, easement reviews is, is really common. Just if you're buying something that you want to develop an upside, knowing where and what the easements can, can what the impact they can have on your property is really important. Thank you, DD. Most people look straight at meth testing. We, this was introduced when we were buying properties in Frankston in Melbourne. Um, <laughs> and the reason the reason that we test for it, in Perth we've had probably like two tests in four years, um, both in Rockingham and both weren't, <laughs> both weren't positive. But it's typically when there's a defect or some issues in the property that can't be identified. Um, what up to you have been a lab there and it starts to chew over walls and just all sorts of problems. So we avoid that where we can. Most commonly it's non-performing structure uses. I think if even Subiaco we find more properties in Subiaco with non-performing structure uses than most other suburbs. They put a lot of ancillary improvements like a, 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 a garage at the back and they wanted to put a studio on top. You know, owner builder has done it himself, hasn't told the council, it's not compliant. You've paid an extra hundred thousand for the use of that, which now needs to be taken down. So that can be a real problem. Or buying older homes, typically we buy high, high land value assets, which typically are older in nature. Or if probably built in the 60s, kind of builder got carried away when he was living there, put on an extension, put a bathroom, kitchen, games room, pool room. Not once thought he'd tell the council or get it approved. All of a sudden you've got you know, potentially a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of improvements that the council don't deem compliant. You're just going to be in for a, yeah, for a shit fight. And it's going to be really difficult to get things retrospective approved and so we just want to avoid it. There's more properties out there we don't need to compromise by why something doesn't get some approvals. The other one is electric audits. Um, got one at the moment we'll probably pull out on if the, if the seller doesn't agree to pay for it. It's going to be a twenty fifteen to twenty thousand dollar rewiring. That can be that can be avoided. We want to put that we want to know about that. I'm building a pest won't bring that about so it's going to another level getting electrician through to look at the wiring. We want that. We want that cost to be paid on the sell up. Um, portfolio examples. I won't spend too much time here. I've only I think I've included one. Probably just highlights diversification. As was 
touch on before, we're very big on diversification. So the problem is if you held six properties in WA historically, you probably haven't performed that well, but by diversifying other markets around Australia, but also locally, you, you sort of spread your risk and spread your chips. And fortunately, those people that do own four or five properties in Perth at the moment, and do as I say, not as I do, I've cashed out now, got all in on Perth. Um, so I haven't probably lived by this policy, but we are forecasting you know, the market should start to do quite well. So those people that have sat on properties that haven't done a lot for a period of time, hopefully start to see the fruits of that. Um, so this is the client we have now, and they've got one in Mount Hawthorne, one down south in, in Warmbro. So and that's a market that we've you know, looked at the markets in Australia right now. Just saying, Jacob, Rockingham and Mandra are the hottest markets in Australia right now. There's about 20 buyers agents down there. We're missing out religiously. Um, just be aware when you're buying down there, um, it can be quite, it can be a lot of issues with the properties. So we had a lot of buyers agents on the East Coast will send a property manager through to do an inspection. They'll buy some of these properties at 20, 30, $40,000 of work and get paid 400 for it. So just be careful. But those markets, when we look at the property cycle, we'll just jump back. Um, you know, we do see Rockingham and Mandra you know, with value for that sort of sub 500 price point without compromising, compromising on asset quality. Yeah. Um, so we're buying about five to seven properties there a month at the moment and it's getting more and more competitive and we're seeing price growth pretty much on a monthly basis. Um, so portfolio examples, again another portfolio, we might um, go through that. Home buying, it's just a different beast and everyone heads up that department. Very emotional, um, emotional is not always a good thing, so just be careful in this space. Um, but Ron does a lot of his work in the off market space, so we don't have to compete, which is also helpful. But um, some of the suburbs that you know, recent purchases for clients is, has been in the western suburbs, those markets have performed well and it has gotten really competitive. Um, don't look at the one year growth rates because they're very incorrect. Pepin Grove hasn't dropped by 23%. One or two sales will. Half of that. Yeah, that's. Yeah, it's actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So the five year growth rates, top performers really been Sydney Beach, uh, Florida and uh, Cottesloe. Um, but yeah, just a different beast, no buying across the board. Um, just make sure, again, due diligence is really, really important, particularly when looking at where you want to spend the next five, 10, 15 years. Yeah, people in the street want to know the properties. What are they going to do with the property next door? Are they going to knock it down if they are? Do you want to live next to the construction site for two or three years? So a lot of different things that you need to consider. You, know, you want to adopt some of the investment mindset across when buying a home. Um, and having a clear strategy is almost more important than home buying space because like I said here before, we want to be selling to emotional home buyers because home buyers will never, inevitably pay a lot more than an investor because you get emotionally fueled, you go to seven or eight home opens, you miss out, you miss out, you miss out. The next one you go to, the wife will just say, I don't care what this girl's for paying it and then inevitably you pay 10%, 5%, like market So we don't want to be setting records in this space. Commercially, um, I won't spend too much time here, but I'll just give you a bit of a breakdown of what we're seeing. So essentially the gap between buyers and sellers, there's a big divide because obviously the cost of money's gone up. So what were people were trading at, you know, yields got down in the industrial space down in the 4%. Now, you know, sellers are probably in the fives, the buyers are now in the sevens or eights because the cash, you know, cash rate's at 3.6. When they were buying these assets, the cash rate was sub one. So what we've seen is, Sale so transaction volumes for the last quarter of last year was 64% down. So we've just seen a standstill. People waiting to see how the commercial market's going to play out. So it's, the yields are um, inflated by somewhere between 25 and 50 basis points. I think you know, buyers who want to get back into the market probably want to see another 100 basis points. I think we'll probably meet in the middle probably 50 basis points. Um, so that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the one year returns are now sitting below the three to five year returns um, for both growth and yields. That's pretty consistent across all sectors, with retail being the only outlier there because obviously retail COVID impacted those markets pretty dramatically. Um, the property market as a whole here in Australia has certainly outperformed the UK, US, but it's just a question of whether their cash rate has gone obviously higher than us, whether that's just a lag and we, we need to see how this plays out. When, when you've got Evans and other economists saying the cash rate may come down, I think we'll just see low, low transaction volumes in the commercial space in the next 12 months. For, for investment, that is. Different in your primary place of purchases. So our key, I suppose, recommended commercial strategies, it could be a good time potentially to look at 
foreign place of business. It's market dependent, so the reason I say that, if you're going to buy an industrial shed in um, Melbourne, for instance, it's actually, you, know, you don't get a discount, you'll pay more for something that's rented than you will for something that's vacant. So it's arguably those markets, you're better off just taking out a lease because yields are so low, four, four and a half percent. Versus Perth, there's still a gap, it's a significant gap in the market between what you buy and what you pay to rent. So there's certainly value in buying your foreign place of business. Um, and just value add strategies, you know, trying to look for opportunities now because you know, we're not going to see that inflation in yields, also the contraction in yields of what we saw over the last five years. Five years, so looking at different sites where you can add value, and that's still in the residential space. We always like value add strategies to complement it, or strategic partnerships. What I mean by that is buying vacant and stitching a, a lease, and then obviously adding value from day one.